ADHD Rewired, episode 443. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Stephanie Antoine. Stephanie is a self-care and ADHD coach based in California. She hails from London with roots in the Caribbean. Stephanie spent many years studying meditation and yoga to reduce stress, chronic pain, and to keep things together before finally being diagnosed with ADHD at age 40. In addition to her professional work as a violinist, Stephanie is a qualified teacher of MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, from UMass, practiced and trained to teach yoga, and the, you're going to have to pronounce that for me, the Something Institute. Iango. That's the one of of San Francisco, (laughs) and is an ACSM personal trainer with an ICF coaching certificate. (laughs) Yeah, um, none of that helped much when I was a mum burning out. Uh, <laughs> so tell us, yes, yeah, let's, it, let's start right there. Yeah, it's this experience of having kids that needed more than I had and, and really burning out around that was, I think, what put me on the path to being a coach, actually, even though I had no idea about it at the time. And I lost a couple of siblings in there as well. Mm. I had a sister that died in her early 30s very suddenly. Mm. And then my brother died at 40 of complications from ulcerative colitis. And mm. the impact of that and being far from family and not actually knowing how much I was overdoing without enough support kind mm. of put me on my knees. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, so what did that burnout look like for you? It was complete chaos because you know that uh, ADHD can result in a lot of not showing up for things on time, not being able to say yes to too many things and then really not showing up for them. Challenges with impulsivity and mood regulation. Um just a lack of capacity, reduced capacity to juggle. And I've been masking for a really long time. I'm working extra hard to get stuff done. And also, you know, there's this curiosity, isn't there, when you have ADHD, where you're interested in a lot of different things, mostly at the same time. And so this kind of pulling apart. um, And eventually, I just got very anxious and very depressed. And I could not, I was not functioning well. I was not being a good mom. I was not being a good spouse. I was an unreliable friend. I was not who I wanted to be at all. Just dragged in. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really bad. So was it, Stephanie, (laughs) was, was there a moment where you just kind of go, that's it. Something's got to change. Like what led you to the path to first discover you at ADHD? And then my husband and I were having, uh, I mean, it took a therapist. There was a therapist that we went to see We'd been to see other couples therapists and we went to see this therapist and she was the first person that could see this whole constellation of symptoms in our relationship, in my lack of reliability, in the stress that we had as a family. She was the first person to look at this and think something other than, you know, this person's useless. Because the other thing that can happen is that depending on your position in the social hierarchy, you can reinforce stereotypes that people have about who you should be. And so you get actually held in the dysfunction mm. that you're in. I think that's so true, especially with our families of origin as as adults. We when we get back together with our you know with our siblings and parents, yeah. it's like we tend to go back to like our teenage selves. Yeah, but it is also projected in a systemic at a systemic level onto. Mm-hmm 
you know, for example, like with ADHD, you know, often people will say that you're lazy, for example, you just need to try harder. They can tell that you're a smart person, but you're just not getting your stuff done. Yeah. So what happened was that this person looked at the constellation and they said, one of the things I remember her saying was, you don't have two children, you have six and need more than the average kid. That that was a perspective changer for sure. Then she sent me to a psychiatrist actually. And I went to him and I thought, you know, he's going to diagnose me with some kind of mood disorder or, you know, he's going to tell me. And he looked at me and he said, uh, you've got ADHD. And when I thought of ADHD at that time, I thought of, you know, Dennis the Menace, little yeah. boys running amok, creating havoc. How on earth did I have that? <laughs> and I'm sad to tell you, it was not a straight line, Eric. I, I didn't... I did not find community really Mm. with my ADHD, Uh, my community. I did do a lot of work. So we did do a lot of work in terms of parent training. We did get a lot of support for ourselves and our kids. But in terms of my own community, that didn't really happen until pandemic. So what for you, what was your community? At the time or, or at um, the time before? Well, you said before the pandemic, because I know that you're, you're, you're involved with ADA um, and some other communities. Yeah, but like I wasn't that. involved with ADA before pandemic. Okay. I, I joined ADA, actually. I joined ADA two years before <laughs> the pandemic. I didn't log on even once. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. It was the classic thing of, of, you know, you find this resource and you just don't use it at all. So anybody it, that's listening, that's yeah, anyway, we, waiting. We, we, are, we deal with that with our adult study hall programming. It's like we're I'm trying to work on building out some uh, email responders. So when someone signs up, it's like, well, it's not going to help you if you don't actually log in. Like just yeah. having your credit card charged once a month is not going to be the thing that helps you. Yes. But I would say that having the connection is actually a first step. Oh, it's huge. Connection so not, is to, huge. not to beat yourself up about the fact that you signed up and then you haven't come in, yeah. right? To say, oh, I took the step of joining this thing. What's the next right thing to do? Stephanie, we should create a support group for uh, for people who sign up for things and haven't used them. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people would sign up for that. <laughs> they just, they just want to show up. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> on your journey, yeah. you got diagnosed with ADHD, but from I think from what you kind of shared with me before you started exploring what you can do about that, would you say you were stressed out and overwhelmed and? Yeah. And the thing is that I was practicing meditation and yoga. It it basically saved me. You know, when I came to the US, I was, I had a lot of uh, repetitive strain injuries. I was incredibly stressed out because of course I'm undiagnosed with ADHD, right? And I'm operating in a, in a very competitive, intense world, in music world. And I don't know I've got ADHD. So I'm just constantly in fear, right? When I'm doing gigs, am I going to show up on time? You know, am I prepared? Often I would not be prepared. It reached a real extreme actually in undergrad because I was quite a talented violinist, but I would not do the foundational work. I would really struggle to do the foundational work. So this came to a head actually like first year in undergrad that I actually failed the technical exam is it was three octave scales. I actually mm-hmm. failed that, much to my teacher's chagrin, and then came top in the year in the performance. The, so it's like the the easy stuff was what's what really hard. It's the hard stuff that's easy. It's, I mean, man, there's so yeah. many things that we could say about that with ADHD. It's the practice, right? The practice. Practice is, is the so The showing hard. up for the nitty gritty, for the icky, for the difficult, for the not much progress to be seen here. There's not much dopamine to be gotten there. So I would really, really struggle with that. And it undermined my confidence. It undermined my ability to notice what was good because we also very good at noticing the negative Mm -hmm. and things. And yeah, I think it made me a less reliable friend and family member. I think I was a diva, actually. (laughs) How so? Um, Yeah. Well, I think I wasn't, you know, I was kind of self-absorbed. I mean, and I don't know how much more self-absorbed I would be than the average, you know, teenager sort of person in the early 20s, but I would get very anxious and friends well, would and that's very just normal. try to sort of calm me down. Yeah. You know, for the teenage brain, like they say yeah. the teenage brain is actually like the most self-absorbed brain because of all the neural pruning that's happening. Yeah. The, the side effect of that is real sort of self-centeredness. Yes. It's, you know... Well, it maybe sucks to be around if you're not that person. Um, it's yeah. normal. Yeah. 
So yes, of course, much of this is not abnormal, but my experience of it was just, and also I was a black person in a very white space all the time. And so the, there's a stress, even when everybody means well, that there is a stress around being the only, there is pressure around being the only. What, what for you is the hardest, um, has been the hardest component of that being the, the only black person in mostly white spaces? I think I think the weight of representing everybody mm. of not wanting to be bad so you're not allowed to fail it, it, it puts this pressure on to succeed all the time that you cannot be vulnerable you cannot be getting C's mm. you you have to you're in this constant state of striving it is exhausting and it's yeah, not it that people are asking you for that necessarily it's just that whenever you trip up you will notice that people will be like well what do you expect from someone like that there's that sort of ever present and it's like you're either elevated because you're special or you become one of them and it can flip flop <laughs> very Man, rapidly. That's, that's a lot to carry. Yeah. That's a lot to carry. It's a lot to walk around with. And then when you add the fact that you might have rejection sensitivity, hmm. it's not pretty. So how has your, as even sort of navigating uh, your, your diagnosis through no, so you were diagnosed how long ago? It was a couple of years ago, or what? At forty, no, sweetie, I'm fifty three. So that was a few <laughs> years ago. You know, so you're diagnosed at forty. Okay, so thirteen years ago. So, uh, see, you're very kind, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were already engaged in a you had a, a meditation practice. You were doing, you were getting trained in this. You were you were doing this, but pretty- I was sweating. I was sweating through it. You know, I was trying. I was one of those people, you know, who have got to empty the mind and it's just all got to be, you know, you just got to get the thoughts out. And I was striving, I was efforting and it was not, that is not the thing. You're straining to relax. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And yes, it's so necessary, right? It's so necessary. It's like, at this point, I look back and I'm like, I'm really glad that I got sent to that relaxation class after my latest asthma attack at 17. Wait, you were sent I, to a relaxation class after an yes, asthma attack? Yes, I was, because I kept having these almost deadly asthma attacks. It was really bad. Mm. So my doctor, and I had no idea, I had no idea what relaxation felt like, actually. Mm. I, I didn't know. I didn't know how tense I was. I'm still a very tense person. My, my massage just, therapist keeps telling me that. Right, right. <laughs> and so... So I got sent to this class with all these really old people. I mean, really, they were just, you know, older than me. And we would <laughs> we would learn these relaxation things. And I would be, I'd be lying there going, why? I'm like, this is so boring. How can we do, how are you doing this to me? But then every single week that I did that class, I would sleep all night. Hmm. You were thinking that hmm, there might be something to this. I did not think that at the time, Eric. Oh, interesting. So what, what helped you connect those dots? I like I was being tortured. Yes. It's not necessarily pleasant at the time. It, it's really uncomfortable because think about it. You take somebody who's, whose mind loves to just go, 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 mm-hmm. out, 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 jump all over the place. And then you're getting that person to lie down and stop. And then you're saying to them, okay, now we're going to tense this one part of your body and you're going to really feel into what does it feel like to tense the foot, like squeeze the foot, feel the muscles squeezing, see if you can sense the bones and then now relax the foot. What does it feel like to have a relaxed foot? And then you move up to the ankle. (laughs) And you go around the whole body like that and you're like, if you're not already asleep, which some people did, that was the other piece of this, was people would be snoring in the room, you know, it's absolutely disgraceful. I I have been through some meditation classes where... The snoring right. was unbearable. Nobody nudged them, right? It's so sad. Anyway, suffice it to say, it wasn't a great entry. I think there are ways to, mm. some of this is, some of this stuff is hard mm. at the time. And what you do is you kind of dose it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. What does it feel like if I stop for 30 seconds? If I pause? What does it feel like as I sit in the chair right now? Just these moments where you just bring the attention inward. And what's so great about it is that in those moments where I pause, then I can notice the chatter and what's happening. And then I can, I have more choice about what I do when I start doing next. So for example, 
if what you do is you go to this relaxation class and you relax, you might notice when you get home that actually there is a lot of fatigue. And so then the gap, the barrier between staying up on YouTube all night or going to sleep, that that becomes a different calculation. You you may, might make a different choice. And I think that's what so many... That's how so many of these practices are very helpful for so many people is that they support a pause, a pause, a stopping, a non-doing. And inside that pause, there is a different choice that can be made. Speaking of pauses. Yes. We have to take a pause here for a quick break. And we will be right back to uh, answer this question of (laughs) why is it so damn hard to relax? We will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our award-winning coaching and accountability groups at coachingrewired.com. Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live the kind of life you want to live with ADHD? What would it be worth to you if you were able to work beside other adults with ADHD to be understood and accepted and to finally tap into that potential maybe you didn't even know you had? Before this group, I thought I had to do this alone or with the support of other neurotypical people around me. I joined this group because I was exhausted trying to do everything myself. Before this group, I was busy but not efficient. I joined the group for all the tricks of how to plan and they work. Increasing my time awareness without being stressed is such a big win for me. What I learned in the course of this group is that change comes much more fluidly with less resistance and more or acceptance of self. Yeah, like learning to plan, you know, daily planning and uh, thinking that through, whether it's the night before or the day or the morning of, and then also yearly planning and uh, how much that's going to affect me in the future. Things that I've learned is scheduling, not over scheduling, time management, and how to plan for the future. I think that I've, I've made strides that would have taken me 10 years, if not more, if I weren't in this group. I discovered hope and the possibility of change around things that I was convinced were immovable. They just taught me to be compassionate with myself and to say, hey, you know, this is a process. So many times in my life, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Only this time I'm grateful. This is the place that you have ADHD to be. And I just want to thank everybody for being here because it's so powerful to just listen and be with everybody else. Do you have a vision of where you want to be, but you're feeling stuck because you aren't quite sure where to start if this sounds like you and you're ready to make the investment in yourself come learn more about our coaching and accountability groups at coachingrewired.com and congratulations to everyone who signed up during our early bird registration events for our fall sessions kudos to you for committing so far in advance early bird registration is now over but don't miss your chance to join us for this fall's sessions beginning september 29th and 30th through December 8th and 9th. Take the first step now. Get on our interest list at coachingrewired.com. Every season, our coaching members work together to learn how to ask better questions, plan their days, weeks, and months, and discover that they don't need to do any of this alone. If you want to join us this fall, then head on over now to coachingrewired.com and sign up to receive your invitation for our next registration event this Thursday, August 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern. If you can't make it, go to coachingrewired.com to get your name on our interest list and stay informed our upcoming coming registration events. Deadlines to submit all pre-registration submissions are at 11.59 p.m. the day before our registration events. So go to coachingrewired.com to learn more and to get your pre-registration process started. Join the coaching community built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD. Kickstart your personal growth and harness the power of community by going to coachingrewired.com to get registered for our next fall registration event this Thursday, August 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you are listening to this weeks, months, or years after this came out, head on over to coachingrewired.com for the most up-to-date information. Take the first step by going to coachingrewired.com wired.com to add your name to our fall interest list. Come grow with us. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back. So right before the break, 
Stephanie was kind of going through with us. And I think it was a, the way you just set it up, like almost made it feel even more painful of going through each body part slowly. And I, and I'm, I like doing like body scans, but I just love the way you set it up. I really felt like I was there, there with you. You know, it's funny when, when I was in like high school and college, I was like, I was like a champion relaxer. I could like, I was chill as fuck, right? Like, you know, it's like study, relax. Yeah, we can relax. Let's hang out, right? It's, and I have noticed in my adult life, it is much harder for me to relax. I like sometimes don't know what to do with myself. Like this feeling of doing nothing, mm -hmm. like something's wrong. <laughs> yes. You, you know why that is, right? Why is that? Because we're socialized. We're in a cult of overdoing. We live in the cult of manly wakefulness. Not sleeping in America is a superpower. The amount of pressure there is on people not to sleep, to be available and doing 24-7, 365, it is devastating. It is devastating for the people that are doing it. It is devastating for their families. It is devastating for all of us because we no longer have time to muse which is something I think so many of us are naturally good at. I mean, when you think about it, right, even in a neurotypical brain, 50% of the time is in the default mode of mind wandering, mm -hmm. right? Then you add to that the fact that we as ADHDers have a big challenge between from getting from default mode to positive, what is that thing? Positive um, attention or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like our meandering mind follows us into doing. This is why it's so hard for us to get into doing. And then there's all this incoming onslaught of mm. stuff, of notifications, of emails, of people, of bosses. It is never ending and we are drowning. We are drowning in it. And it creates so much challenge in self-regulation, mm -hmm. in impulsivity, in insomnia. And the solution is to stop and to practice stopping regularly. So Stephanie, what about the person that says, but, but Stephanie, I have, I have so much that I need to do. Yep. I think that it's like, you have to kind of work to get some kind of understanding of just how much, how frazzled you are. You have to, if you're just listening to this and you're thinking, well, that woman said, you know, I have to practice stopping. I don't have time. You have to somehow figure out a way to carve out some space to notice what happens if you give yourself a break and then come back, because typically, and what people report is any time that they do that, most people know that if you go on vacation, when you get back from vacation, it's hard, but you're typically much more productive. We're more productive before because we know the break's coming and we're more productive afterwards because we're not as tired. It's the same, it's the same with this. If you, so here's the thing, when you relax, the parts you, you stop, well, you can stop. This doesn't happen all the time because if you have a lot of stress reactivity, this can actually make it worse. So with that caveat, so if you are suffering with a lot of panic attacks, this is not true necessarily for you. And it's important to say that. However, if you are not dealing with a lot of panic attacks, when you relax, at first there's a big flurry. There's a lot of noise, a lot of static, and then it will calm down. And when it comes down, the bits of you, the prefrontal cortex, the areas that do the thinking, they have more capacity. So you get to think more clearly and do more of what you want instead of being stuck in this ruminating, machinating, perseverating mess where, you know, that feeling where you can't actually decide what the next right thing to do is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... The way to shift that is to go for a walk, for example. If there's a lot of agitation, sometimes what you need to do is to calm it down is to go for a walk, perhaps up a steep hill and get the blood flowing and so on. I love doing that when, especially if I'm trying to make a decision about something. Yeah. And one of the things I should do is I'll, you know, write on a, just a sticky note. What is this question that I'm trying to ponder and figure out? I'll put yeah. it in my pocket. And then as I'm walking, when I notice my mind has wandered, I put my hands yeah. in my pocket and realize, oh, I'm here. Here's the question I'm trying to figure out yeah. and uh, doing it in motion. And that process of noticing the mind wandering is building the muscle of observation. Mm -hmm. That noticing, as soon as you notice something like that, 
you're no longer caught up in it. And I think that's the really, really helpful part. Because as soon as you notice that you have been meandering in your thoughts, you can say, oh, I'm mind's wandering. Is it though that it's, it's not just that it's building the muscle of observation, that it's building the muscle of observing self? Yes. Because I think well, it's we're, observing I, what's happening, what's arising, which may be you or something else. Well, because I think we tend to be like excessively good at, at observing our environment. That we're noticing every damn thing that doesn't even matter, yeah. right? <laughs> but are we noticing that we've been down the, the internet rabbit hole for an hour when we just meant to go look something up real quickly for this project yeah. we're working on? Yeah. Right. So it is kind of that but self-regulation. That's about what's actually happening, like. I'm thinking about one thing, but what I'm actually doing, what's actually happening right now is that I'm in YouTube again. And all because I'm avoiding something else. <laughs> I'm avoiding something else that I just can't bear to start because I don't want to do it on my own. What do you use for, for yourself when you have a, a task that you had to do that you're like, So Ugh. I I will escalate like I make commitments or I will get into a body double space for somebody. And if it's really extreme, then I will coach on it. I will get coached on it. There's an escalating kind of thing. How much am I avoiding this thing? You know, I, I have, and also, you know, Oh, it's so important not to feel bad. Once you notice these things, especially when you have been diagnosed later in life, there are so many habits that have been there for a long, long time. And like for me, one of them is not wanting to look at the bank account. Yeah. I don't want to go and look at the bank account on my own. Nobody else can see it when I go, but I want to sit with somebody while I look at it. And it took me a long time to realize that that's because on occasion when I've gone and looked at the bank account, it's given me bad news. <laughs> And I'm fearful of the bad news every single time I go and look. I, I, it's something I, uh, uh, about a year or two ago when I was going through my divorce, my, my therapist was like, log in every day. You got to log into the bank account every day. And so mm -hmm. she would ask me about it, like, how many times have you logged in this week? Mm. And it's, it's when you said that, I was like, oh, I used to avoid that too. And now it's very much of a habit, which is always fun yes. to kind of have that moment of realization. Like, oh, this yeah. thing that was once hard and I avoided yes. is just part of what I do on a regular basis now. And isn't, isn't that something that like when you're coaching that I have a client that needed, that wanted to do something with some jewelry in the safe and had been wanting to do this for a very, very long time. Then when we coached on it, she discovered that... Actually, what was going on was that she couldn't remember the how to get into the safe. That's, That's a barrier. Though, but yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the, the thing that you think, the thing that you're imagining, the thing that you're ruminating about is not actually where you can, where your power is, because your power is always in the present, in the present moment to take action. But if the mind is wandering in the past and the future, constantly past, mm -hmm. future, all the time, it's really hard to get to where you are right now. So when people are like, I can't pause. If you want to be in the present, you kind of have to practice pausing to get there. How else are you going to get to the present moment? But it's so boring, <laughs> Stephanie. It is. Yeah, it is. And it's. Um, I think the only way I know to deal with that is curiosity, honestly, to examine in those moments, what does this feel like? to bring your awareness, as much of your attention and as much curiosity and kindness that you can to that unpleasant and difficult moment. So it's non-interpretive observation. Yes, you're, you're observing what's arising in the moment, moment to moment awareness without judgment. Right, so as, not uh, evaluating the classic it, mindfulness, it's good or bad. Um, yeah, and then, and you see what's there. And I don't know that there's a way, I certainly haven't found a way to avoid that discomfort. I think that the way that I've learned to deal with it is to accept. I don't mean huge amounts of suffering here, Eric. I don't mean, you know, forced sitting with, because we all endure that as children, right? Undiagnosed ADHD kid. I would cry sometimes in class because mm. of the pain of having to sit quietly while some person droned. So I am not advocating that. I'm just saying that in your own kind of self-regulatory process, that this coming inward process, you can make it slightly more bearable if you are curious about what makes it unpleasant. Mm -hmm. What is it about it? What is it? What does boredom feel like? Because we all know it feels like something, right? Where do you feel boredom? I think in my body, it's like this sort of sinking 
almost a feeling of despair. Mm. Where in your body? Uh, there's like a tension. There's like a, so in a little bit in my hands mm -hmm. because my hands always want to be doing something like right now. I kind of wish I had my little doggy with me so I could pet her or I wish I had some crochet. I didn't bring a, a tactile thing. So there is a sensory deficit for me. I will get like a dry mouth, a desire to put something in my mouth. Mm. And I might get like a sinking feeling, mm. a sinking feeling in my stomach, like a fear, a kind of real fear reaction of not, not wanting, not don't want this. Please don't make me. Do you think there's different kinds of boredom? I think when it's observed, it dissipates because curiosity has this fantastic way, I think, of breaking up these difficult feelings just because the observer observing kind of changes the suffering. So for example, if you stub your toe, there's the ouch and the, oh God, I wish that wouldn't have happened. But there is also the possibility that you can explore, wow, that's an interesting feeling. Now is it, what is that feeling of stubbing the toe? What, where, where exactly does it hurt? Is it limited? Is it radiating? Is it hot? Is it cold? Like, what is it? And when you bring that curiosity, it can lessen your perception because really what it's changing is your perception. Awareness and curiosity can have the capacity to change our perception and our experience of what's happening such that it's not quite so awful in the moment. It's sort of, it's the stories that we attach to yes, our sort of sensory exactly. perception. That's what creates yes. struggle, like suffering, right? Yes. It's that Buddhist philosophy of, you know, yes. you can experience pain and not be suffering if you're not yes. resistant to the pain. Yes. So the, I'd say the biggest capacity that I've increased and that I increased after my diagnosis was the increased capacity to be with the difficult, with less reactivity. Mm. That's what's, that's the muscle that I think I've built over the last 13 years. It's not to be sneezed at because there is a lot of, I had, you know, severe chronic pain and I had really, really, really severe asthma on occasion. And I'm still a reactive person now. I'm still not, you know, super calm, but I have capacity mm. to be very, very quiet now. Very quiet. I used to not know what it felt like not to have any thoughts happening in my mind. I did not ever experience quietness in the mind. But over time, when you practice meditation, the mind does quieten down. This is absolutely not the first thing that happens. The oh. first thing that happens when you stop is you hear all the thoughts and all the conversations that have been waiting to be heard for the last God knows how long. That is the first thing that can happen for many hours, many days. I refer to it as the feeder of the mind, right? Like yes. as soon as you sit down to meditate. The committee. Yes, when you sit down to meditate after it's been a while since doing it, I know the first week or two is just going to be like internal thought city, right? It is just, yeah. and so, you know, I sort of imagine myself having my, my popcorn and just watching the thoughts, right? It's, right. It's just like, and I often find myself because I am able to really maintain a curious perspective on my thoughts while I'm trying mm. to meditate. Mm. I often find it hard to not laugh. While I'm meditating. That's fine. But no, that's good. Yeah, because I think so many of the thoughts that pop into my mind are just so absurd that it's yes, like, no, I think that's I a very it. natural, natural response to it because it is, it's hilarious when you listen to some of this stuff. Some of it that if you weren't observing it so closely, it would be torturing you. It would be ruining your day. And instead you look at it and you're like, wow, that was interesting. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> So we, we have to take a break here in just a second. I wanted to uh, yes. try something though for, for our listeners. I'm going to do something and uh, obviously I'll only do this if you are in a safe place to do this, but I'm mm. going to, and I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to be for, but I'm going to ask mm. you at the very end just to like gauge zero out of 10, how either comfortable or uncomfortable it was 10 being really painful and uncomfortable. Okay. Mm. So here's what we're going to do. If my internal clock was working right, that was only 15 seconds. Mm. So how either uncomfortable or at peace were you with that? So something to kind of to think about. I was, yes. 
And if it wasn't, and if it was uncomfortable, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Then that's what happened. One of my teachers says that we practice practice. We don't practice results. Mm. His name's Philip Moffat. He's an amazing teacher. And that meant a lot to me because one of the things that can really compromise our experience when we're doing these things is the desire for a particular outcome. Mm. That really causes a lot of problems. I think when people have ADHD, the broader the, and this is from another teacher of mine, Tuere Salah, who is amazing. She's in Seattle. The broader the beam. So for example, if you are practicing meditation, uh, looking with your eyes, that it's easier for a person with ADHD to practice uh, perhaps spending some time noticing the difference between seeing and looking and to just sit with that. What is the difference for you between seeing and looking rather than doing a very narrow meditation like Trataka, where you look at a candle? That type of meditation is not so easy to access for people. So if you've been trying to do something like a type of meditation, and it really is very, very hard, you don't have to keep suffering and struggling with it. Find something that actually you will spend time and do, that you will actually do, that you're willing to practice and I, do that. I didn't know that uh, the meditating using a candle, what was it called? Trataka. Tra- okay, I never I had not T-R-A-T-A-K-A. heard that before. T-R-A-T-A-K-A. Well, it's funny when you mentioned, because when I first started meditation, I was in grad school mm-hmm. and I started it because my like amount of anxiety I was experiencing, because mm-hmm. I just got fired from an internship and I thought I wasn't going to finish grad mm-hmm. school on time. And I was mm-hmm. like having panic attacks. So mm-hmm. it was the thing that I knew at the time to do to help alleviate that. And so I was doing a lot of stuff with candles, but I kind of made it more fun as I was mm-hmm. really working on controlling how my breath was. And so I would mm-hmm. go put the candle further and further back and see if I can sort of make it dance with my breath. And I got That's pretty great. And it became a cool party trick too. I can blow out a yes. candle from pretty far away. Yes. <laughs> And you see, that's an example of ADHD ingenuity right there. You take a technique that you've learned or received, and then you make it your own. Now, of course, some teachers are going to, you know, just not be happy with that. Like, for example, you might not do very well in a Zen tradition necessarily, especially in some Zen traditions, you know, they have the the teacher walking around with a stick to make sure that you sit up properly. Oh, God. And (laughs) for me, the Iyengar tradition in the end did not pan out for me. The Iyengar yoga. There is, there's a lot of precision in that. But what I did with that precision was I beat myself up over the head with mm. it and gave myself an eating disorder mm. because of the strictness of the practice. And because also I was a young mother at the time doing this teacher training, working with many teachers who were like monks, basically, in their, in their lives. And I did not understand at all that I could not do practice in exactly the same way as somebody who had no children, no husband, that that my practice would look different. But I was intolerant of that. I was intolerant Mm. of having any weakness. I think I perceived it at the time. Mm. And I really did a very severe injury to myself mentally with that Mm. attitude. And so now it is so important to me that practice does not do harm. That that's not, it's to reduce harm, not to, not to increase it, to increase safety, not to reduce it. We are uh, reducing how much time we have left on this podcast. So we're going to take a really <laughs> quick break. It's been so much fun with you. We're going to come back. We got a few more minutes, but we'll be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall at adultstudyhall.com, the virtual co-working community built for adults with ADHD who just get it. From our weekly guided sessions, also known as ASH Plus, to our 24-7 drop-in room, this just might be the virtual co-working community you didn't even know you needed. It's only $19.99 a month, and it's free to try for the first week. This is the virtual co-working and body doubling community where people with ADHD are getting things done while also having some fun because we don't have to tackle any of our to-dos alone. Come join us. Try it risk-free for the first week and it's only $19.99 a month after that. Go to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. (laughs) 
Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Perks like ad-free episodes start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. I want to welcome Melissa G and Hiller C. I not sure if I pronounced your first name right, but welcome to you for joining us on Patreon this week. Welcome to our Patreon community and thank you for your support. Are you looking for a little taste of coaching? For only $25 a month, you can join me for our our monthly Patreon coaching call. This is for patrons only. We do it every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. You get that plus our ad-free episodes. And at $10 a month, you can also get a recording, audio recording of our monthly coaching calls. So at $25 a month, you get the monthly coaching calls, the audio recording of our monthly coaching calls, and our ad-free episodes in our private RSS feed that connects to almost every podcast app out there. So just a reminder, for our $5 a month pay patrons to set up your private RSS feed if you have not yet done that. So once you've signed up, go online. Uh, don't use the app. Go to the actual website. Click on the membership tab on the Patreon site and you'll find directions on how to connect your private feed to your favorite podcast app. Unless your favorite podcast app is Spotify because they don't support private feeds. We appreciate all of your support on Patreon, no matter the amount. If it is in your budget right now and you find value in this show, consider becoming a patron over at ADHD rewired.com slash patreon perks start at just five dollars a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you your support helps make possible the things that we do here at adhd rewired at adhdrewired.com slash patreon and thanks again for your support and we are back all right, so we know that we we in our culture, this self care is the buzz, right? And you know everything's self care, like uh, the self care sale. You know, you buy yourself something. It's right, like all. There's so much more to self care than just indulgence. And now, sure, indulgence can be like one component of self care. I look at also the things like planning and making meals, like things I don't particularly find mm-hmm. fun. Right. Mm -hmm. Last night after I made dinner, I made my lunch for today and prepped dinner for today. All last night. I didn't enjoy any of that. But what I do enjoy is having a healthy lunch, knowing that I'm Mm going to be able to go home and just throw something in the oven that's already prepared. Right. And that's like that decreases the stress. Yes. So what do you think when you think about self-care and you're working with your clients around self-care? Um, I think so often people have this idea that they need to put the people that they're caring for ahead of themselves. And actually the opposite is true. And it's very counterintuitive. A teacher of mine said, told a story about four different types of caregivers. There was a person that couldn't take care of anybody. There was a person that only took care of others. There was a person that only took care of themselves. And there was a person that took care of themselves and others. Ooh. And as I was sitting listening to the story, I couldn't understand why the person who was only taking care of themselves was above the person who was only taking care of others. Because as a mother, I was like, well, my God, you know, this is terrible. How can you be a mother that that only takes care of herself? And so I put my hand up and the teacher, he said, if you only take care of others and you don't take care of yourself, you are very likely to wind up not taking care of anybody at all. You will be at the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. If you only take care of yourself, you are much more likely to become a person who takes care of themselves and others and that can do it in a sustainable way. Mm. And it was a real paradigm shift for me because up until that point, I had felt that taking care of myself while my kids were still kind of, you know, struggling was an act of great selfishness that I should not be actually experiencing ease and abundance while my kids were suffering. And it took a big shift in uh, the paradigm for me to understand that I couldn't take care of them if I was not prioritizing my own well-being. I I just wouldn't be available to them. I I would be too irritable, too snappy. I mean, I'm like that a lot anyway. It makes it hard to show up as your best self. The me that comes back from from the break is the kind of person that my loved ones Mm -hmm. want to spend time with. They want to spend time with her. She's got space. She's got time. She's kinder. And I don't think people realize, again, because culturally we are in this do, do, do. And there is so much hidden work in caregiving 
that many caregivers really are underestimating also how much they're doing because it's mm-hmm. invisible, it's unseen, it's unvalued. So what I do with my clients is that I help them, I support them to become more aware of how much the chaos, both internally and externally, is causing them harm. And then to take steps to make space for something else to happen. So even like, you know, yesterday I was speaking to somebody and I said to her, I'd asked her the magic wand question, you know, if somebody could give you what you need as a mother with two kids with special needs and a husband that's working from home, what is the thing? She said, oh my God, two hours a week. And I was like, okay, two hours a week. How do we make that happen? She kind of looked at me like her eyes went big and she's like, what? I said, yeah, let's make that happen. How do we make that happen? And it turned out that her parents live nearby and the way to meet the need of two hours was not mostly about the childcare in her case. Most of it was the belief that she was holding that she shouldn't need two hours a week by herself. And what was she going to tell people if she wasn't with her children? Mm. Like, really? So, so much of this, we feel when we're putting these very difficult positions, we often will think, and often, don't get me wrong here, there are exigent circumstances. If you have a very sick child, you know, in the hospital, if you have a parent at home with dementia, if you are the only breadwinner in your family with, you know, the only thing in that type of situation that you have is the capacity to slow down and shift your perspective. You might not change anything around the outside, the external, but how you perceive and react to it, that is something that we all can practice. And that on its own can reduce suffering. I think that's probably a, uh, a good place for us to end, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie Antoine, our website is stephanieantoine.com. It's uh, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-A-N-T-O-I-N-E. Don't worry, the link will be in the show notes. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time and for uh, for sharing your story. And uh, this was fun. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, Eric. I've really enjoyed the time. Thanks, Stephanie. For all our listeners, self-care is not self-centered. And selfish means we're taking care of self and it doesn't need to be a reward. You can do self-care based activities because it's going to help recharge that fuel tank, your executive function fuel tank and increase your capacity. So go do something that recharges you today. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader 
would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.